Afternoon chat. Uh, this is Dr. Jeff Butler and today uh, it's a beautiful sort of fall afternoon here in uh, Tecumseh, Ontario. And uh, we're going to be going over a clinical case again. And today's clinical case is going to be a 27-year-old male who comes into family practice. Um, well known to you. He's otherwise completely healthy. He's a non-smoker, a non-drinker. He's had trouble with a worsening cough over the course of the last five days. Um, an associated fever. His temperature's gotten up to 39.2. Um, he's done a couple of COVID tests and they are both negative, but he's really feeling quite achy and unwell and he's just presenting for a treatment of this condition. So you as the resident, you relate this information to me and in a quite proud fashion, you sort of stipulate that this is definitely pneumonia because he has some green phlegm that you want to put him on a Levaquin, which is a fluoroquinolone. And this case is pretty much a slam dunk. And what I would do at that moment in time is I would pause a little bit so you would know that something's not quite right. And if I'm honest, something dies inside of me a little bit because this case is something that we see commonly and people will mistreat it. Um, and I would pause and I would ask you specifically, what percentage of actual coughs that are productive of a green sputum are actually bacterial? And if you think about this and you remember, we've gone over this a, a number of times in my clinic, you'd remember that that number is about 10 to 15%. So the vast majority of coughs that are actually productive of a green sputum, 85% plus, are actually not bacterial. And this has been supported in a number of studies. I remember the first one I came across was maybe um, in 2009, 2010, done out of Scandinavia that supported this, from this, this actual fact. And in similar studies, they actually demonstrate that if you have a cough with clear phlegm, that the actual chances of it uh, being a bacteria is actually 5 to 6%. So it is clinically relevant from the standpoint that if you have colored phlegm, it's at about a two times risk of actually being bacterial, but you always have to remember that that number is very small and the majority of those will still not be, not be, not be bacterial and be viral. So I would have the resident pause and take a step back and sort of say, well, how do we approach you know, this issue in and of itself? And generally, I always try to get residents to think in terms of algorithms. So you can organize your thought as best you can. And what we do a lot in acute cases, we always define our algorithms into emergent, versus non-emergent differential diagnoses. And you always wanna make sure you go through the emergent ones first, just so that you're not missing anything. And those are the ones that can come back to really bite you if you're not careful. And within the emergent ones, you'd certainly have generally respiratory compromise or respiratory collapse. Um, and that's when the respiratory system can't keep up with gas exchange. You would have cardiac issues that would result in cardiac decompensation, mainly resulting around congestive heart failure, like flash pulmonary edema, those type of things. Um, You'd have issues with respect to asthma, status asthmaticus, those patients where they're really not being managed well and they're really, really tight and really short of breath and may require hospitalization. Um, aspiration is another one, specifically in the young. I'll always remember a case where I saw a little one about two years of age. Didn't sound quite right. Had, we did a chest x-ray to see what was going on. And in a roundabout fashion, we had to send that person to the hospital. Turned out they had swallowed the, um, the end of the milk, the milk bag that you cut. That little triangular piece of plastic, they had actually swallowed it and aspirated it into their lung space. Um, and that was a rare case, but you better think about it in the little ones. And then the last one's probably a pneumothorax in terms of the most common ones that we'll see. A pneumothorax is when you get air trapped between the actual lung and the chest wall and the lung sort of pulls off the chest wall. And for a bonus point, if you can remember what's the clinical condition where you'll see more pneumothoraces, and if you're thinking Marfan syndrome, which is a connective tissue disorder, then kudos to you. That's a very good point in your favor. Um, but otherwise, you get an asthmatics too when they actually have blebs that rupture and there's, there's air that forms along that wall. Which is the one that can potentially surprise you? And the one that you should keep your eye open for is pneumothoraces because <clears throat> they vary <clears throat> excuse me, from mild to severe and a mild one can sometimes surprise you. So depending on how the patient looks, because they don't have to be marfanoid, but if somebody's very tall, you might want to have a higher index of suspicion get a chest x-ray done. But other than that, you would sort of be moving from your emergent algorithm to your non-emergent algorithm. <clears throat> now, within the non-emergent algorithm, um, you really have a very, very broad differential diagnosis. Um, certainly, you can have med side effects um, that can develop. And there's one medication in particular that's more likely to cause a cough. Um, and if you're actually thinking in your head about an ACE inhibitor, which is an angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor, you'd be absolutely correct. Um, and that's something we use for a number of things, but, but blood pressure predominantly. Um, but then you can have actual respiratory conditions in and of themselves and asthma again and that type of thing. Um, allergies can do this to you. Cardiac issues can do this to you. Um, infectious causes are actually uh, abounding in this particular area. Smokers and, and the side effects associated therein. Metabolic abnormalities causing acid-base disorders. 
So there's a really large differential. And, and how do you subdivide that so you can have a better approach when you're seeing patients like this? And generally, we look at cough from the standpoint of whether it's acute, subacute, or chronic. And acute coughs are defined as being coughs that are present for less than how long? And the answer to that is actually three weeks. And certainly this would qualify for this particular patient. So we're gonna deal with that back in a second. But before I leave this area, the subacute is actually lasting from three to eight weeks and chronic coughs are defined as greater than uh, eight weeks. And the reason I bring up chronic coughs is because the differential for that, the top four things will be smoking and, and side effect coughs with that, allergies and, and responses to allergens of that nature. Again, asthmatics and, and how well they're managed from their cough perspective and reflux potential. Silent reflux where people are having heartburn. It's not actually causing heartburn, but it's irritating the respiratory tree and they get a cough. And the reason I mentioned those four is just to point out again that all four of those are non-infectious. None of those are treated with antibiotics. So if you're seeing this in family practice or in clinic, you should not be jumping to the idea of prescribing an antibiotic because it's just not relevant. So if we get to back to our particular case, so this 27-year-old gentleman who's otherwise healthy with this fever and this cough, when you start looking at that differential of an acute cough, you're certainly gonna run into a lot of different things. Now, because he's 27 and you know his history and he's otherwise healthy, he doesn't have a cardiac condition, he's not a cardiomyopathy patient, um, and that you can sometimes you know, be tricked by a little bit very, very rarely, but you know, if it was more chronic, you would do an echocardiogram and see what that looked like. Um, but let's say, for this, or say to this argument that that's off the table. Similarly, when you're looking at respiratory compromise, he's not an asthmatic, he's sitting in the actual room, he's not in any type of distress, and you've listened to his lungs and he's not actually wheezy. Um, so it's not gonna be an asthmatic potential. He's not a smoker, he's not on any new medications. So very quickly, you're gonna get into this infectious realm. Um, and when you look at that, you start looking at is what's most common from this perspective. So you're looking at differentiating between like a, a common cold um, versus something that's like bronchitic versus something that's pneumonia. And we really want to get to the point of trying to figure out whether this could be pneumonia, at least in this age group. In children, it's a little bit more broad, but this is the differential we'll be looking at. So from the standpoint of the common cold, how common is that? And I will tell you for the sake of these videos, there's, I generally hold on to lots of numbers and the numbers I've presented so far are numbers that I usually use because I find them useful in terms of working around patients. But there's a couple numbers that I don't usually hold on to and this is an example of them. How common is the actual common cold? So in the United States, um, the common cold, they estimate that you have about 1 billion cases per year. So that's a billion people potentially coughing, none of whom need an actual antibiotic. So then you look at bronchitis and how common is bronchitis? And this is, again, not data I would normally hang on to, but in the States, they estimate there's about 10 million cases of bronchitis um, on a yearly basis. And in bronchitis cases in adults, what percentage of bronchitis is actually bacterial? And that percentage is actually less than 10%. So more than 90% of those cases will actually be viral. So again, not requiring any type of antibiotic. And then you get into the cases of pneumonia. And in pneumonia, um, you actually have the majority of those cases actually being um, um, viral still, but how many of those happen actually in the States? And you get about 900,000 or a million. So when you look at the numbers, roughly, you know, less, less, less than a million of cases will be pneumonia, 10 million will be actual bronchitis, 1 billion will actually be a common cold. Of the actual pneumonias, maybe 50% are viral, a little bit higher percentage are actually bacterial and because patients are sicker, those are the ones we oftentimes will treat with actual um, antibiotics. So coming back to this particular case, um, I asked you more specifically, what did his lungs sound like? And you didn't pick up on anything specifically. So we're left to sort of see if, whether we listen again to see if we can hear something um, or whether we need to get a chest x-ray done. So let's say we listen to the chest or, or, and, and this time we heard some crackles. So crackles allude to abnormal breath sounds where there's some consolidation or some accumulation of fluid or pus that's causing a crackling sound. So let's say we either heard that or we have a chest x-ray that showed that we're actually were positive for an actual pneumonia. Um, if you did hear it in and of itself, there is a question about would you actually order a chest x-ray? In, in Canada and, and pretty much anywhere, to be honest, if you actually have a clinical case where you have an outcome in terms of what you're going to be doing with it, and that's not going to change based on the actual testing you're doing, then you wouldn't order that specific test. So if you actually heard crackles and they were actually significant, you wouldn't order the extra chest x-ray. But let's again say that you weren't quite sure um, and you didn't like how the patient looks, so you did chest x-ray. And in this particular case, it actually showed that he had pneumonia.
So now we're left with this actual diagnosis where we have a patient who actually has pneumonia. So do we actually treat this patient? What's the most common cause of pneumonia? I mentioned it earlier. And that most common cause will be viral pneumonia. So about 50, 60% of cases will actually be viral pneumonia. Cases that we actually don't need to put on any type of antibiotic, they're gonna resolve on their own. Um, now about 15 to 20% of cases will actually be bacterial pneumonia. And in bacterial pneumonia, what's the most common um, bacteria type that causes pneumonia? And the answer to that is streptococcus pneumonia, which represents about 20, all the way up to about 60% of all cases of pneumonia. And that bacteria type is what type of bacteria? And that's actually a gram-positive bacteria. And what does that mean? So histologically, um, there's a way by which we subdivide or differentiate bacteria. And it's based on the thickness of the actual cell wall. Um, or more specifically, a component that's called peptidoglycan. And this, this is something that you thought you wouldn't use since histology lab, but this is where we actually use it. And peptidoglycan is something that actually responds or absorbs the uh, dye crystal violet, um, and it will actually show us how thick that actual cell wall membrane is. So when it's thicker, it's usually a gram-positive, and when it's thinner, it's a gram-negative. So strep pneumonia is actually a gram-positive bacteria. So if you know it's strep pneumonia, you then start to look about, well, what will we actually do to treat this? And this is why I didn't like the choice the, the resident made at the beginning of this actual story. Um, you have to be very careful when it comes to bacteria resistance. Any of us who are in the actual medical field, be it nurse practitioners, be it physicians, we have an onus to try to protect the population. And antibiotics and antibiotic resistance are becoming a really big problem. So when I first started practicing, first line treatment for this was actually a macrolide. Macrolide class of antibiotics are like erythromycin, zithromax, which is azithromycin, or biaxin, which is clarithromycin. But if I go back to when I was just starting to practice back in 1995, what do you think the incidence of macrolide resistant strep pneumonia was? And that percentage was about 3%. So 97% of the time, this was effective in eradicating that particular bacteria type. If I fast forward to 2015, so 20 years later, what do you think the resistance is then? And the resistance at that point in time was around 23 to 24%. And in recent studies done in last year and this year, that resistance is found to be upwards of 40%. And this is the problem we're getting into. So you have to be very careful about using antibiotics that are appropriate for that condition and not using antibiotics that are more broad spectrum and are used to treat more rare infections. So in the example that was given uh, initially when the resident came out and said they wanted to use um, Leviquin, Leviquin is a fluoroquinolone class, which is very broad spectrum, and it should be reserved for very sick patients or immunocompromised patients. In this particular case, first-line therapy would just be amoxicillin, um, which is a penicillin variant, which is effective against 90 to 95% of actual um, strep pneumonia. Um, so let's say it's not strep pneumonia. What's the other causes um, that can be present for bacterial pneumonia? Um, the second most common cause is a bacteria called Haemophilus influenza, and that represents about 10% of cases. And that's followed by um, mycoplasma pneumonia, which is walking pneumonia, um, chlamydia pneumonia, and then very other ones like Legionnaire's disease and those type of things. And just as an aside, since I mentioned Legionnaire's disease, this is for all those people who watch TV shows. What percentage of doctors who maybe diagnose Legionnaire's disease would then go to the person's house to find out if maybe their air conditioner was contaminated and had Legionnaire's disease? And I hope that everybody realizes that, that percentage is zero because that just doesn't happen. So you usually keep your medicine to the actual functioning area within which you work. So those of us in clinics will actually maybe make that diagnose rarely. Um, and, sh and then all kidding aside, if you actually think that Legionnaires is present, if you got a history of that, it's something that you do have to notify public health about. And public health is the one who actually does those type of investigations. So getting back to this particular case, so if we've now determined that it's actually pneumonia and we've actually prescribed the antibiotic, what if he couldn't have amoxicillin? What is second line and third line treatments? So second line is actually in Canada, doxycycline, and then we start to use the macrolides, which we didn't use before. And in particular, what we should note is the macrolides are particularly effective against the mycoplasma pneumonia, which doesn't respond to actually amoxicillin. So this is why that becomes second and third line. So now that we've treated this patient and he's gone on his merry way, we can have general conversations about what do we do if this patient had recurrent pneumonia and, and sort of just continued to get this. What type of things do you recommend to your patients?
Um, and in general, we, we fall back on those parameters we talked about with the last case, where we talk about general well-being. So certainly, if this patient is stressed out, we want to de-stress that environment. And if the patient just isn't generally healthy, so they're not exercising, they're not eating well, these are things that you can maximize. And if you do maximize them, your immune system picks up, you're less likely to catch these infections, you're more likely to fight them off. And that's something that you want to be maximizing as much as possible. Um, similarly, this is something we're seeing more and more regrettably. Um, if you've been immunized against these particular bacteria, it's, it's obviously much, much, much less likely that you'll get them. And nowadays we're having less and less people that are immunized against them. And that's a personal choice. It's something that we have to live with. But it's certainly something that's there that you have to sort of be going over with them. And if this particular case was dealing with an older patient, there's an argument to be had that once you've talked about general lifestyle aspects they want to be maximizing, that newer immunizations designed towards, towards protecting them specifically. Um, in Canada, we have Prevnar, there's Prevnar 13, there's Prevnar 20. There's various immunizations that could be utilized in this particular case. Should the patient be okay with that, they would sort of protect them in the long run. So just give that some thought. Um, that's the case for today, sort of a simplified case um, because this is sort of a fairly broad topic. We'll sort of come back and do another case at another point in time. Take care.